Well, hello there, fellow poets, literati, and illuminati. I know you're watching. In this episode, we're going to be talking about five uncommon poetry writing tips to help you instantly write better poetry. But before we get into the tips, I just want to say, hey, I'm Nikita. This channel is all about creative writing, all about literature. Sometimes I even make a joke. So if any of those things or, you know, all of those things sound interesting, then hit that subscribe button and we can be friends and have lots of fun and learn things. All right, let's get to the tips. All right, tip number one, focus on one central image or emotion. This is something I see tripping up a lot of newer poets. You get tons of ideas and start writing things down for your poem, and that's good, unless you never rein in your writing afterwards. What you might end up with is poems that are scattered or seem to be about nothing in particular. Now, you've probably seen this issue either in your own poetry or in the stuff people are posting online. It's really quite common. You'll see a poem that's going from talking about the sky to a girl to death, and there's swords there too, and roads, and you're bringing up memories, and on and on. But what's, what's the poem really about? There's nothing wrong with having all those ideas and even writing them down in a first draft, but you'll want to scale that back as you edit, especially if you're just starting out. Poetry is all about concentrated effects and emotion, so spreading yourself thin like that is actually pretty dangerous. Now you might be thinking, but Nikita, there's lots of poems that have multiple images and emotions. And yeah, you're right, but I'd also point out that most of those poems are longer, often much, much longer. Sure, you've got poems like The Wasteland, Leaves of Grass, Paradise Lost. You can definitely cover a wide array of images and emotions in a poem, but that will require advanced skills and many, many pages. There you go, that's kind of like a bonus tip number 1.5. Keep your writing short. Think about it this way. If you were painting, you wouldn't start off by tackling a huge canvas. You'd maybe do some sketches or work on a smaller canvas and develop your skills and confidence. A huge canvas means every flaw will be more visible. And what's worse, you'll take longer to finish it, so it'll take longer to learn from the mistakes that you've made. Or, even worse, you'll never finish it at all. And it's the same with music. You wouldn't start off by composing a symphony. So write five quality shorter poems that are hyper-focused and make one image or emotion truly shine. But how do you do that? Well, there's two solid ways to approach this. Number one, start from an emotion and see what images stand out to you. So if you want to write about fear, let's say, see what images stick out to you and evoke that emotion. Ghosts, spiders, the neighbor's dog, water, whatever. A long line at Starbucks. The image itself isn't even necessarily as important as the things you do with it. And then there's way number two. Start from an image and see what emotions you could evoke and explore with that image. If you want to, let's say, write a poem about a mint plant, for example, you could start with that, or a scene in which you have the mint plant. See what that makes you feel, or what might be an interesting feeling to associate with it. Maybe it's freshness and optimism. Maybe it's a cool, apathetic distance. Any image can work with any poem, pretty much, if the other elements are working. So don't be afraid to play around with things. The haiku is a great form to study to improve your ability to focus on just one image or emotion since it's so short and restrictive. Haiku almost always feature one dominant emotion and often only one image, which makes sense because you're not going to be able to develop much more than that in just a few syllables. Matsuo Basho's haiku, The Old Pond, is a great example. Let's take a look at a translation of it by Robert Haas. The old pond, a frog jumps in, sound of water. Here you get the one image of a scene by the pond with this frog jumping in. The emotions here are subjective, obviously, but I'd say tranquility is dominant. Another great example of focusing on only one image is The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. So much depends upon a red wheel barrow, glazed with rain and water beside the white chickens. Here, you only get the one image as well, the red wheelbarrow beside the white chickens. And yet it still has power because of the tense line breaks and the opening lines, so much depends upon, which give a weight to what follows. But notice how vivid and powerful basic images can become when they're isolated in this way. Alright, moving right along to tip number two. Develop 
tension. But what is tension? Well, it's essentially the emotional pull between two things. So the same way that you would get tension when you pull a rope tight from both ends, you get tension in your writing when two elements are pulling away from each other or are in opposition. Tension is another thing that poets that are starting out often don't really know about or pay much attention to, and it's really hurting their writing. Tension is what gives poetry its energy. Without tension, you'll almost certainly have a lifeless poem on your hands. The worst thing is that since tension is something that works below the surface, even readers that aren't familiar with the concept of tension will feel intuitively that something is missing. They might say that a poem is boring, flat, or too simple, but often that'll mean that it's lacking in tension. So, how do you go about developing tension in your poetry? Well, there's three kinds of tension, and I'll be releasing more in-depth videos on each one of them in the future, so make sure to subscribe if you'd like to see them. But for now, let's just take a look at a quick summary of each kind. The first kind is conflict, or narrative tension, probably the most famous kind. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you knew it already. Narrative tension puts a character in opposition to something, whether that be another character, their environment, themselves, and so on, and then attempt to resolve that opposition through the plot. Maybe there's a killer on the loose. Maybe a character's lover is unfaithful. Maybe there's a gun in a room that the character has just discovered. That's narrative tension. Then there's the second kind of tension, which I want to focus on most of all, and that's thematic or subtextual tension. Thematic tension works on the level of ideas, feelings, and images, which is why it works below the text. Subtextual, you feel me? Some concepts and images are naturally in opposition to each other, and evoking or implying these oppositions is a great way to subtly add energy and life to your poetry. Some examples include life and death, love and hatred, happiness and sadness, sun sunshine and rain, hot and cold, childhood and adulthood, cats and dogs, Mac and PC, war and peace, and so on. We already briefly looked at Basho's The Old Pond, which uses thematic tension between the old pond and the energetic frog. You get the word old, which naturally implies its opposite, youth. You also get the initial stillness of the pond, which is contrasted by the movement of the frog jumping, and the implied movement of the sound of water. Once you start looking for thematic tension and things, it's kind of like a virus. You'll start seeing that everything you enjoy uses tension, and you can't escape it. To give you another example, in T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, even this simple couplet, In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo, uses the tension between coming and going to make the scene much more energetic and to add depth to what's going on. Imagine how much weaker the couplet would have been if that tension was gone. In the room the women come to and fro, talking of Michelangelo, or, for example, in the room the women feast on escargot, talking of Michelangelo. The newer versions feel somehow aimless, somehow dull, don't they? That's why you want to be harnessing the power of tension in your own poetry. Once you've applied tip number one and have an image or emotion in mind for your poem, try evoking or implying something that's in opposition to it. So, if your poem is about loneliness and aliens, for example, a line about companionship will add a powerful dynamic. If your poem is about sadness, throwing in a touch of happiness somewhere will help you add depth to the poem. And finally, there's the third kind of tension. Tension in form, otherwise known as formal tension. That's probably the hardest to master and the most complicated to explain. Essentially, it deals with the technical choices a poet's making, such as line breaks, punctuation, and so on. We've already seen a couple examples of formal tension earlier in this video. First, in the old pond, with the use of a hyphen in the first line, to cut the poem into two pieces quite sharply. The hyphen here makes the reader pause for a moment as as if to reflect. And then again in The Red Wheelbarrow, with the use of line breaks that cut words like wheelbarrow and rainwater apart to give the poem extra momentum and energy. That's all the time we have to talk about formal tension right now, but stay tuned for a more in-depth video talking about what it is and how to use it. Okay, moving on to tip number three, leave some room for the reader. If there's any way to summarize these tips into a kind of mentality to approach a writing with, I'd say it's less is more. Now, though you might be tempted to try to say everything that's on your mind, or to explain the intricacies of your chosen subject in your poem, you need to realize that you'll never be able to say everything. Part of the problem 
and magic of language is that it inherently only points in the direction of the things it refers to. You'll never capture the thing as it is in your writing. As a result, poetry is as much about what's not said as it is about what is said. Much of the beauty of poetry comes from the way the words open up to each reader's personal experience and interpretation. Over time, you'll find your preferred balance between how much you want to say and how much you want to exclude. But when you're starting out, it's much more harmful to try to say too much rather than than saying too little. So I would suggest cutting a lot out at first. You'll be surprised how much stronger some poems will become when you reduce the amount of words by half and allow the ones that remain to truly open up and breathe. If we invert this tip and attempt to expand the old pond, you should be able to pretty quickly see how even a few extra words here and there really begin to add up and get in the way. So we start off with the original, the old pond. A frog jumps in sound of water. And then we expand it. The old pond is still. Then a frog jumps in swiftly, and I hear the sound of water. The old pond is still and tranquil. A frog is revealed in the grass, and it jumps in, and I hear the sound of it splashing upon the surface. Naturally, this isn't the best example, but I hope even here you're beginning to see how you might be able to reduce and condense parts of your writing to really allow it to open up. Another good way to leave the poem open for your reader is to resist the temptation to give your poem one clear message or meaning. And some will disagree with me on this point, and if you do, that's fine, but I'm of the belief that you're better off focusing on developing images, emotions, and themes in your poetry that can speak to readers on their own, rather than hammering your own interpretation into the poem. Even famously didactic writers. What's didactic? Essentially writers that specifically have a moral or a message in mind. So even didactic writers like Tolstoy profited from leaving their work sufficiently open-ended. And since poetry is even shorter and more condensed than prose, the only way to really pack a punch in so few words is to leave the right things out. Alright, tip number four. Take a risk. At this point, you should have some simple yet powerful writing under your belt. You're writing focused, energetic, and evocative poetry. Now, you're ready to add even more depth to your writing with a little bit of risk-taking. When you're starting out, you should try to keep risk-taking under control. Again, there's a balance that's unique to you that you must find. Some people may be perfectly content writing in existing forms like sonnets or exploring popular subjects, and there's nothing wrong with that. Others may want to completely reinvent poetry as we know it. Most beginner poets find themselves too far to one side or the other. Either they're taking no risks, or they're taking too many too fast. Taking no risks will hold you back without a doubt, but taking too many risks will probably open you up to mistakes that you'll be too inexperienced to catch. However, as you find your center, don't be afraid to try something new and daring, and see where that leads you. Experiment with techniques and poetic forms, push boundaries, and play around with each new piece. For example, try messing around with punctuation, put one of your words in all caps, do something completely unrelated to the poem, and see what dynamic that creates. Basically, do something your reader won't expect. In fact, do something crazy that even you don't expect. The worst case scenario is, it won't work, and you'll just have to adjust it. But the experience of play and experimentation will help you grow and learn way more quickly. And for the last tip, tip number five, steal more. Some poets are hesitant to copy other poets and artists, and I can understand why. There's something special about originality, and nobody wants to be just an imitation. Unfortunately, though popular, that way of thinking also prevents many newer poets from learning as quickly and as effectively as they could be. When you're starting out, you should copy. You should steal. Take your favorite poem and write it out yourself line by line. Replace words in it, expand and shorten it, write your own version about a carrot, find out what makes it tick and why. Obviously, I don't mean publish those studies, no one needs to see them except you, but they're extremely valuable as learning tools. So get into the habit of stealing. T.S. Eliot, in one of his essays, said, One of the surest tests of the superiority or inferiority of a poet is the way in which a poet borrows. Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. Bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better, or at least something different. The good 
poet welds his theft into a hole of feeling which is unique, utterly different than that from which it is torn. The bad poet throws it into something which has no cohesion. A good poet will usually borrow from authors remote in time or alien in language or diverse in interest. There are two key points to draw from what he says. One, immature poets imitate. That's the natural way to learn. And it's better to imitate and learn than to lose yourself trying to reinvent the wheel. All great artists imitated the masters before them. And two, mature poets take ideas, emotions, and techniques from other contexts and transform them into poetry that is powerful and innovative. So, as you develop your skills, what was once an imitation will turn into adaptation and eventually transformation. Before you know it, you'll be writing evocative poems based on obscure 19th century German poets you love and transforming famous paintings into genius word collages. Or maybe not, but you'll be doing your own awesome thing either way. Alright, hope you enjoyed those tips and found them valuable. If you did, please hit that subscribe button right now for more literature and creative writing content to come. If you have questions or suggestions for future topics you'd like to see, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.